to them and their adaptability for our change in format. We also want to recognize our other philanthropic partners without whom our support for by all means and the local children's cabinet communities would not be possible. Among those, the Carnegie Corporation in New York, Linda Hammond Ori and Andrew Ori Charitable Trust, the Oak Foundation, the Schwartz Family Foundation, and the, Fa the Shaw Family Foundation. Thank you all for your generous support. Uh, I wanted to say a few words just in, in getting started about this particular moment and what it represents to us. And we'll be talking more about the future of the By All Means Consortium and where we're headed. But uh, just in this particular moment, um, uh, I, I think we have not only an opportunity within our respective organizations, but a huge opportunity within our sector that I wanted to talk about. You're all familiar with, I'm sure, this um, uh, Chinese character, uh, this Chinese word for crisis, uh, which is composed of two characters, one for danger and one for opportunity. We're all familiar with the uh, formidable dangers that uh, have created such tragedy and uncertainty and disruption in our society. Uh, but we don't spend enough time talking about what kinds of silver linings or opportunities might uh, come out of that. And I wanna take a few minutes to, uh, to focus on those possibilities uh, in, in my opening remarks today. Uh, one of the things that I've noted is that all of a sudden in, in, a, in a very visible and urgent way, issues that we've been talking about in our By All Means Consortium forever about the profound inequities that affect the lives of, the, of those who we have least well served in our school systems and in our society generally, have now been revealed to the public in a very vivid way. It's as though a tidal wave has pulled back from the beach, pulled back the ocean and revealed the ocean floor. And on that ocean floor, we see deep disturbing inequities that have existed forever are the lived experience of those who live there. Those of us who have an opportunity to work there are familiar with these circumstances, but the inequities in the way of health and mental health, food, housing, internet and technology, uh, access to out of school learning, things of that nature. All those things now suddenly are on the front page because many in our society assumed that schools were taking care of all these things so that when schools closed, they began to get worried about who was going to deal with these uh, challenges and how would these inequities be mended because we've all had a blind faith in schools as the great equalizer in our society. Um, and suddenly there is a sense of urgency about all these topics. And there are many competing priorities, but they all converge in the lives of families that we care about and for whom we're trying to create cradle to career pipelines to optimize their chances of success. Next slide, next slide, please. So we're, we're kind of recovering from something not the same as, but equally dramatic in some respects as an earthquake. And coming out of that, there are a number of challenges facing us. We've got to meet basic Maslowian needs in terms of health and well-being, food, shelter, clothing, things of that nature. We need to stand up, dust ourselves off, reconnect with other people, start communication up again and begin to restore the kinds of systems that provide for what we think of as normalcy in life, but are just meeting our basic needs. And once we get those restorations well along the way, we have the opportunity then to think about redesigning. Are there things in our existing systems that we actually don't want to restore, but that we want to use this opportunity to pivot in a more effective, more equitable direction? And that's after all what the Education Redesign Lab is all about, is thinking about those redesign challenges. Right immediately in front of us, we've got a lot of challenges in terms of connectivity. How do we connect both sort of physically and in terms of normal communication, as well as in terms of internet and social media and things of that nature? How do we do that equitably? How do we reshape expectations for everybody in this enterprise? for parents as suddenly they've become the center of the educational enterprise, for children as they're disconnected and have lost some of the critical relationships with peers and teachers uh, that are at the center of learning, 
Uh, what are our expectations for teachers, for school systems, for healthcare providers? All those expectations are in flux and need to be reordered. Uh, for example, uh, I mentioned families, but in the midst of education, we've been catapulted not only into the world of internet and educational technology, for which we've lagged for many years, but we've also been catapulted into a, a real lifetime partnership with families who are now not just an incidental nice to do connection that we in schools have to make, but they're at the center of the educational enterprise. And we and they need our help and support. If one size fits all didn't work for individuals, it works even less well for families and we have to adapt to that. We also have summer coming up and summer is an enormous opportunity, not only to correct for some of the learning loss that has happened in the last quarter of this academic year, but maybe to get a foot in the door of making summer and out of school learning instead of an accident of birth, making it an entitlement going forward. Uh, so there are all kinds of opportunities of which I've only mentioned a few here. In order to meet these opportunities and take advantage of them, we're gonna need resources. And as you know, uh, as well as or better than I, we're gonna be very challenged from a resource standpoint because of the hit the economy has taken tax collections at the state level and at the local level are gonna be way down at a time when school systems and communities are being asked to do more than ever before for children and families, they're gonna be facing resource cutbacks. Uh, at the same time, they're gonna to have to build capacity to work differently. We, when and if students come back to school in the fall, how we respond to them, how we meet their individual needs, whether we develop success plans for them, how we engage with families, how we use technology to expand the boundaries uh, and break down the limitations of space and time that are incorporated in our current model of schooling. All of that um, takes enormous capacity. Capacity necessitates resources. So we've got those challenges to face. Our colleagues in the field are gonna need guidance and support. They're gonna need coordination. They're going to need what community leaders can provide in this, uh, which is a sense of urgency. So we're in this Sputnik moment. Please, uh, next slide. Uh, this moment of opportunity that I've likened to the change that happened in the federal role in education in the 1950s, you know, when the Soviets put up a satellite and suddenly everybody in America had an enormous sense of urgency about public education because they felt we were lagging behind and vulnerable. Well, I'd argue that we are lagging behind the top performers internationally now, and we are vulnerable in terms of our economy and our democracy. And in this Sputnik moment, in this COVID-19 moment, we do have the opportunity to bring about some profound changes here, not just to restore the status quo ante, but to pivot and to move differently into a future in which we can do far better by those who we've least well served over time and make it a reality that we have systems of support and opportunity, a cradle to career pipeline in each and every one of our communities that truly prepares each and every one of our children uh, to be ready to be successful in a 21st century economy and democracy. So that's the challenge and that's the opportunity. And our deliberations over the next couple of days are really designed to lean into that, explore that, learn what you're doing in the field and uh, learn what certain uh, experts and thought leaders are talking about, uh, come together, share our uh, knowledge, share the uh, journey, share the challenges and our responses to them uh, and make the best of the situation in adapting to it. And we couldn't have a better opening speaker than my colleague and friend, Jack Chonkoff, um, who I'd like to introduce to you and then turn the microphone over to Jack. Jack is the Julius Richmond Family Professor of Child Health and Development at the Harvard Graduate School of Education and the Chan School of Public Health. He's the founding director of the university-wide center on the developing child at Harvard University. He currently serves as chair of the National Scientific Council on the Developing Child, a group of distinguished scholars whose mission is to bring credible science to bear on public policy affecting young children. Jack also chairs the JPB Research Network on Toxic Stress, which is developing new knowledge and measurement capacity to assess the biological, biobehavioral, and health consequences of excessive stress and uh, system activation. 
Dr. Schoenkopf has received multiple professional honors, including elected membership to the Institute of Medicine, now the National Academy of Medicine, the C. Anderson Aldrich Award in Child Development from the American Academy of Pediatrics, and the Distinguished Contributions to Social Policy Award from the Society for Research and Child Development. He served as chair of the board on children, youth, and families at the National Academy of Sciences and led a blue ribbon committee that produced the landmark report from neurons to neighborhoods, the science of early childhood development. He has authored more than 150 publications, including nine books and monographs. Uh, Jack, we're thrilled to have you with us. Jack is gonna speak for a while and then we're gonna open the floor to questions and have a little discussion. So without any further ado, it's over to you, Jack. Thank you for being with us. Uh, thanks very much, Paul. Um, really appreciate that generous introduction and um, appreciate you setting the table for my comments and um, wonderful to be with all of you. I have to say, I much prefer looking at an audience than looking at a, a computer screen. But um, so I'm gonna give you a crash course in 21st century science to show how it's very relevant for all of the challenges that Paul just kind of uh, teed up for this presentation. Um, the title of my remarks is connecting the dots between early learning and the foundations of lifelong health in a COVID-19 world. So um, I'm gonna start, um, I'm gonna go back more than a half a century now, but I'm only gonna take 30 seconds to review it. But there's a basic framework that's been guiding early childhood policies and programs in, in the United States since the War on Poverty and Great Society programs of the 1960s. And that framework has really held up pretty well over time conceptually, but its impact has been variable. So for example, um, whether it's early learning or primary healthcare, we've, we base all of our policies now on this notion that some combination of providing enriched learning experiences for young children, education for their parents about child development, primary healthcare, good nutrition, health promoting environments and community empowerment will all lead to uh, each year, a, a new cohort of students coming to school ready to succeed. And for a, a significant part of the population that more or less works, um, it's not all provided by programs. A lot of it is provided by families and neighborhoods, communities. But the reality is that um, there's a, a, a very important significant part of the population that is experiencing um, high levels of adversity uh, related to all the things Paul talked about. Um, that results in impaired development where children come to school not, um, not ready to uh, kind of meet the expectations and demands of school and also on the road to having more health problems. So the question is, what do we do about that? I mean, we have decades and decades of programs and policies and research and still at a population level, we have very large disparities. So um, following this notion of of the opportunities presented by a crisis, um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the revolution going on in 21st century biology, um, which is really opening up the black box of helping us understand what are the origins of disparities in both educational achievement and lifelong health. And certainly in this, um, in this pandemic, we are seeing a, a tremendous amount of attention on disparities in health outcomes. And I'm gonna say a little bit about um, the predisposing factors for that in a couple of minutes. So for most people, um, understanding where disparities come from, once we get beyond the headlines of the obvious causes related to poverty, racism, uh, unequal distribution of resources, structural inequities, there's a general sense that most people have. Let's see if my, hang on. Let's see if that there's some combination of supportive experiences or what we might call protective factors. Um, parents are very important influence, genes play a role, negative experiences, what we call risk factors, exposure to violence, and all of the things that go along with structural inequities. There's a general sense that all of these things contribute to outcomes in learning and in health. Um, but I'm not a clear understanding that it all kind of goes into this black box and out at the other end comes some part of the population that is successful learning in school, their behavior is adaptive and, and lifelong health and well being is pretty much something that we see. And then for some part of the population, we see the combination of school failure, risky behaviors, chronic illness, a shorter lifespan, less economic productivity. And 
this kind of sense of how do all of these things somehow interact is really not very well understood by most people. And so here we come to 21st century biology, the Human Genome Project, Molecular Biology, the Decade of the Brain. And so one thing that we've learned is that all of these factors, the positive things in our lives, the negative things, our genetics, our kind of upbringing in our families and our communities are all highly interreactive. You can't really separate one from the other. It's not nature versus nurture. They work together. In fact, it's really at the molecular level now that we're beginning to understand the same molecular level that's trying to figure out how to develop a vaccine against COVID-19 or how to test new therapeutics. Getting down to that deep molecular level is helping us understand how experiences actually get into our bodies and affect our learning and our behavior and our health. Um, and so a way to think about this is to kind of understand that all of our early life experiences are literally built into our bodies for better or for worse. This actually begins prenatally um, to make things easier. Let's just talk about from birth on now, although it certainly starts prenatally and actually begins with the health of a mother and father before pregnancy begins. So on the positive side, the things that we've studied the most and understand a good deal about are that responsive, positive nurturing relationships, both within the family and among a broader social network, language rich environments, an increasing sense of mastery, the development of, of executive function, self-regulation, kind of social and emotional development, mastery over the environment, and supportive community services all kind of pile up on the positive side. And when we have lots of these positive factors in our lives, it tips the scale toward positive outcomes. But none of us is without kind of negative influences in our lives. None of us live in perfect worlds. None of us have perfect brains. Um, so when we look at those uh, domains that come under the category of risk factors, poverty, racism, structural inequities, violence, mental illness, the list goes on and on. Um, what science has been doing is helping us understand how do, those, how do those adversities get into the body? How do they actually affect the architecture of the brain? And what about other organ systems? And all of this is tied into an understanding of how excessive biological stress responses, which are life-saving and positive in an acute threatful situ threats uh, like situ situation, but that pile up and have a wear and tear effect on the body over time, how that chronic stress activation kind of interferes with healthy development. And again, I don't have time to go into lots of details with you right now, but I will point you to some further materials if you're interested. That excessive stress activation, increased stress hormones, elevated blood pressure, elevated uh, heart rate, uh, inflammation that gets out of control, all of that can have a disruptive effect on the developing brain. I think a lot of attention has been paid to that in the educational system about how excessive stress, toxic stress early on, disrupts brain circuits related to focusing your attention and simple learning. Um, but also these systems, um, these disruptions also affect other biological systems, the immune system, metabolic systems, and I'll give you some examples in a moment. So basically this can lead to excessive stress, excessive adversity leads to disruptions of learning, disruptions of behavior, and also the greater risk of chronic diseases later on. I'll give you a little spoiler alert here. There's been a lot of public attention to the racial and ethnic differences in the severity and the life-threatening circumstances of COVID-19. And people have appropriately focused on issues related to um, higher prevalence of working in essential jobs without protection or crowded housing, inability to kind of work from home, unavailability of paid leave, all of those things, unequal access to healthcare of a high quality, all of that is true. But what this science I'm sharing with you now is telling us also that the pre-existing conditions that are making people more vulnerable, heart disease, hypertension, obesity, diabetes, these are unequally distribu distributed across the population. And they begin very early in childhood. This is not random. Uh, racial and ethnic as disparities and adverse experiences impose unusual burdens on families of color raising young children. Higher rates of multiple adversities in communities, primarily of color, higher rates of violence in the neighborhood, 
higher levels of financial hardship, all of which over a chronic effect over time, increase stresses on daily family life, leading to increased activation of stress response systems, which then help us explain where these disparities in learning and health outcomes come from. They start early, they are not inborn, they are not inevitable, they are preventable by intervening in terms of the early life environment. They're not preventable by focusing on better exercise programs and better eating and smoking cessation for 30 and 40 year olds. That's starting way too late, given what 21st century science is telling us. I know most of you, this is primarily focused on education. You all understand the pressures on the education budgets. You all understand the return on investment from a better educated, more employable, more economically productive workforce. We have not paid as much attention to the early origins of health problems in, this, uh, in the first couple of years of life. Um, most of you, you folks are at a community level of cities and lower, so um, your budgets are not as tied in to healthcare costs as state level and federal budgets are, but to show you where a lot of money is being eaten up um, by things that could be going toward the kind of work that you're doing. The number one most expensive healthcare cost in this country is cardiovascular diseases, hypertension, heart attacks, um, atherosclerosis, um, and uh, strokes, all of which have their origins early in life in excessive inflammation. Most second most expensive is diabetes, all of which, most of which has its origins early in life related to the metabolic disruptions of excessive stress activation. Uh, depression is the third, is the fifth highest asthma. So these are what we do in early childhood to promote a growth promoting environment that makes children better prepared to succeed in school is at the same time for the same nickel building strong foundations for less chronic health problems later on, which are bud budget busters across uh, all levels of, of uh, federal and state government in our country. So um, what I wanna do now is finish up by giving you a, a kind of a bird's eye view of what some of the most important core concepts are coming out of 21st century biology that helps us understand the underlying biology of adversity and resilience and how this can not only be a source of wow, that's interesting, but provide new insights about the early roots of, of development and health that could be translated into more effective policies, more effective programs, more effective practices. Three core concepts I'm going to present to you right now. The first is the need to connect the brain to the rest of the body. For those of you who are sophisticated about the early childhood field, and I know many of you are, and for those of you who are just reasonably well-informed citizens on this issue, um, there has been a huge uh, change in the public's understanding about the impact of early adversity on brain development, on brain architecture how early experiences build strong brain circuitry for learning and social and emotional development and, and what we now think of as whole child development and how excessive stress activation disrupts circuits in the brain and leads to problems in behavioral regulation and learning that show up in school. But the, that, that's, that's kind of early 21st century biology and where it's going right now is saying all of these things that we said about how experience affects the brain also applies to the immune system, the metabolic regulatory systems, to all of the systems in our body that affect our physical and our mental health and not just our learning and behavior. Um, and the good news is that the same principles of development both build strong foundations across both those fields and also disrupt them. So um, the early childhood field is gonna be much more focused going forward on a real integration of the foundations of both early learning and lifelong health. Second is this very powerful concept of variation in sensitivity to context. This is all about gene environment interaction. Hardly anything is 100% is genetically determined and hardly anything and nothing is 100% environmentally determined. Uh, there are children who genetically are just more sensitive to the environment. It means in a bad environment, it's very disruptive and threatening, they end up doing really poorly. In a really good environment, 
they end up doing better than the average child because of their sensitivity to their environment. They're more creative, they're more attuned to what's going on. So what this means in terms, this is, this is basic biology. And also we know this from common sense. Anybody who is a parent of more than one child, or anybody who knows anybody who has more than one child, knows that children living in the same family, ostensibly in the same environment, are not the same. They don't respond the same. They're not equally sensitive to what's going on. Um, we know from cancer research, there are cancers that run in some families, but not everybody gets it. There are cancers that are, have higher prevalence in some communities, but not everybody who lives there gets it. We look at the variation susceptibility to the COVID-19 virus is our latest example. So there is no one size fits all here. And I'm gonna say a little bit about this at the end when we think about policies and programs. We have to stop asking, what is the best program for children living in poverty? What is, what is, the, best, what is the best curriculum for children who are experiencing the stresses of racism? In every case, we've mostly focused on answering this question of what on average is the best program, but that's actually missing what the essence is of 21st century biology, which is it's the variability that is gonna tell us where the answers are, not in treating the average. The third concept is the importance of timing and critical periods. We know, we have known for a long time that there are critical and sensitive periods in the development of the brain. Um, many of these have been known for decades, that there are certain, at birth, um, most of, we are born with most of the brain cells, most of the neurons that we will have in our lifetime, not all, but almost all of them, but very few of the connections among brain cells, the synapses and the circuitry that actually makes the brain the magnificent organ that it is. And so those connections are built over time and they're not built randomly. They're built in the beginning, in the first couple of years of life, a human brain makes a million new connections every second. You say, wow, that, um, how could that be? But of course the brain has billions of cells and trillions of circuits, so they have to be built at a very rapid pace, but they don't come in randomly. They come in at very predictable times for very predictable functions that are built in to our genetics. And during those critical periods, when the circuits are being made, that's when they are most sensitive to the influence of experiences. So positive growth promoting experiences during critical periods create strong foundations, brain circuitry and then other organs. And excessive stress activation disrupts the development of those circuits and the development of those um, physiological functions at the time when they're most open to be shaped. Um, and then once that period passes, the brain and other organs move on to other circuits and you can't go back and rewire. What you have to do is you have to adapt and the brain can continue to adapt. But the older you get, the harder it is to adapt. You can, it's never too late to intervene or treat, but you'll never get as good an outcome as you would have if you had gotten it right the first time during the critical and sensitive period. So we know that they're important critical periods for many of the foundations of early learning. We are now learning that there's some very important critical periods in the development of the immune system and the development of metabolic systems that make it more or less likely that you will end up later getting heart disease, diabetes, hypertension, stroke, all of these conditions that are not only the most expensive, but that are disproportionately found across the population based on adversity. There it is, the science is sitting there saying, you ignore these very early years at your peril, and particularly for the education system, where so much progress has been made in more attention and more investment in preschool. And um, I'm a big, <laughs> a big fan and advocate for pre-K programs. Um, but from a biological point of view, pre-K programs, even beginning at age three and four, are not they're 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 earlier than starting at kindergarten, but they are not remotely early when it comes to brain development for children experiencing significant adversity. This issue of prenatal programs and programs in the first year or two of life after birth have to start getting more attention, 
and more sound, wise, evidence-based investment because we are already playing catch up at age three and four for the children who are in the most disadvantaged circumstances. So um, I'm gonna kind of end with two take home messages for you and then we can open this up for discussion. The first is how do we take all of this science and I've really just given you the headlines. So there's a lot of very complicated science under all of this and it's moving quickly. There's still a lot more need that needs to be learned and understood. But actually we've been able to distill all of that complicated science into three very basic, easy to understand science-informed principles to reduce disparities related to adversity in both early learning and school, later school performance and in physical and mental health. Um, and bear with me until I get to the punchline because what you should be thinking when you see this is, oh my God, tell me something I haven't heard a thousand times before. So let me kind of go through this quickly. First is the science is screaming that responsive relationships that are individualized between adults and young children are essential for building strong foundations for brain circuitry and other biological systems. Um, strengthening core life skills that comes under the category of executive function, self-regulation, the ability to kind of regulate your emotions, regulate your behavior, the ability to engage in goal-directed behavior. Um, those are skills that begin to come in in the early childhood period. They start in infancy with the ability to focus your attention. They dramatically grow in the age three to five period with children being able to focus their attention more, sit still better, control their impulses, follow directions, all of those things. They come in, they have sensitive critical periods when they come in, um, but they don't come in automatically. It's not like walking, sitting, crawling and walking. They come in by being modeled and scaffolded by the adults who are the most important people in their lives, which means those adults have to have those well-regulated skills and those skills develop by coaching, they develop by practice. And that's why, that's why many of these child family, child parent, two generation programs are so much focused on skill building from adults down to children. And the third issue is reducing sources of stress. So you could look at that and say, well, some combination of these three very simple principles are really all that we need to end up having children who are healthier and more educationally productive and adults who are more responsive and competent in creating well-regulated environments in which children grow up and being economically stable themselves. Um, examples, what responsive relationships, let's put it in the context of childcare, but let me actually get my punchline first. The devil is in the details. Everybody knows that this is what we need to focus on. Um, a lot of people are focusing on it, but we're not making as much progress as we need to, so why? So here are some examples. Uh, the importance of res responsive relationships cannot be overstated, which is why notwithstanding the administrative and economic problems of staff, staff attraction, recruitment and retention in early care and education programs, high staff turnover in early care and education programs are not only an administrative burden for the managers of the program, they, they produce a cycle of continued disruption and reestablishment of relationships with children, children who have good relationships with good providers and those get broken. That's a source that activates the stress response, stress response system for young children. Talk about reducing sources of stress, a lot of focus on, on how to buffer families and children from a lot of structural inequities that they can't deal with on their own. But what about the sources of stress that we impose in the way we have people determine eligibility for programs and having to fill out different applications every time you go to a different agency and how you're treated when you sit in the waiting room. There are so many ways other than just curriculum to think about how we could be reducing sources of stress, strengthening stable relationships, building core skills, all of which individually and collectively either build strong brain circuitry and healthy biological systems or threaten them and disrupt them. So I just kind of want to leave you with uh, one final word about this issue of variability in response and make a plea for the need for rethinking uh, how we define what we call evidence-based programs. Right now, the official definition 
of an evidence-based program that comes from federal education legislation is a program that at any time in one study showed a significant difference between a treatment group and a, some kind of control or comparison group, preferably a child outcome, but not necessarily, it could be a parenting outcome. Um, but there's no requirement for replication. Um, one study with one significant finding entitles you to call yourself an evidence-based program. So kind of here's, here's how that works. If you think of this, this as an imaginary evaluation, the red horizontal line is kind of no effect and the, the dots represent different scores for different participants in a study. And the way we work right now is if the mean effect, the mean difference between the treatment and control group reaches statistical significance, you've earned your label of an evidence-based program. The problem is what we should be doing and what both early education, education as a whole, and health, early health promotion and disease prevention needs to move toward is to ask a different set of questions. Why did this intervention work so well for these children and families? Why did it work so poorly for those children and families? Start to figure that where it's working, we can start to scale effective strategies to people for whom it works. And we can go back to the drawing board and not have those for whom it's not working kind of tag along as part of an average effect. The net result is that we build a suite of programs and policies across sectors, across early education, across health, primary health care, across human services, across child welfare that matches different strategies to different resources, needs, and outcomes. It's not a million programs for a million kids, but one size fits all. I'll leave you with this last thought. If we just asked how, what's the most effective treatment for cancer, um, we would have an average effect that would hide the fact that we can completely cure some and not really make a big dent in others. It doesn't tell us anything meaningful. So this was my attempt to give you a quick uh, tour through some of the very powerful concepts that are coming out of 21st century biology that have tremendous relevance for early learning, foundations of early health, and how we begin to think about them together. For those of you who want more information, Here's the uh, URL for our website. We have a lot of material that translates complicated science into understandable language for um, folks like you. You're a major target audience for us. I will stop here. Thank you. I wish I could have made eye contact with some of you during this presentation, but I'm um, really looking forward to having a good discussion now with some, some of your questions. Okay, Jack, thank you very much. Please join me, audience, in a virtual round of applause for our fantastic speaker. That was uh, very provocative uh, and builds amazingly well. Jack, the last time we were together with this group, we had uh, Tony Eitan from the California uh, Endowment talking about so many of these same issues, the social determinants of health. Uh, and so this group has done a lot of thinking in that domain. So I'm gonna invite audience members because we'd like to spend the balance of our time fielding your questions. I'm gonna get us started while you're thinking about your questions. If you please um, channel those into the question and answer box and then we'll sort out as many of those as we can and try and respond to them. Jack, you're, um, you know, as you well know, we've got an audience here of community leaders as well as education leaders. In the education sector, we're notorious for kind of one size fits all thinking, a confusion between equity and equality. And all of what you're talking about in terms of variability and the kind of intersectionality of all these circumstances requires a real paradigm shift from <clears throat> thinking about average kids to thinking about each kid individually, meeting them where they are, giving them what they need inside and outside of school. Um, and so I wonder, <clears throat> What would be your advice to leaders like those that we have in the audience in thinking about how to bring about such a massive culture change in the way in which we do um, uh, education generally and in the way in which we think about preparing young people for success? Practically speaking, if I buy this, what do I do Monday morning? Yeah. Oh, God. Start with a nice softball question. Yeah. So let, let me... Um, let me, let me kind of respond in the following way, which is kind of, you know, based on what we've been learning by trying to roll up our sleeves and get involved in a lot of this. There is, there is there's a tremendously powerful 
framework of, of ways of thinking that are coming out of very sophisticated scientific understanding of how life experience and environments and exposures get into the body and affect the way we develop. Um, but that by itself, um, if we make that science accessible to people who are working in the field, it doesn't necessarily make it easily actionable. And so that's where what we've been learning is that it's, it's, a, it's a real genuine, and I mean authentic partnership, um, and not just kind of token, uh, you know, saying you have a collaboration between people who bring scientific thinking that's informed by a very rapidly moving frontier in science with people who bring practical on the ground experience and expertise of actually how to kind of implement, whether it be curricula or whether it be kind of approaches to organizing a school environment or whether it be a framework for thinking about how to operate at a community level. There is, there's a lot of um, kind of traditional ways of operating that have, um, that have been very ingrained um, that I have found, um, you have to find the right people. You need to find the, the flexible people in science, the curious, flexible people, the change agents in education and human services and community development, um, and an authentic voice at the table from families raising children in a variety of circumstances to come up with some new ideas and new strategies, not to scrap everything we're doing, but to try to be more specific at identifying whether it be particular groups of children and families, particular problems, particular concerns, not the whole, not the whole thing, but a, an identified problem and say, what could we do differently to address this problem? It could be anything from kind of you know, early literacy skills to you know, behavioral mm -hmm. difficulties to kind of poor to control asthma or kind of uh, family violence or depression. And to say, so if what we're doing isn't good enough, what might we do differently? And this is where we have to somehow incorporate the culture that drives places like Silicon Valley and biomedical technology, where people basically identify a problem and start trying things and expecting that they're going to fail over and over again until they hit something that looks promising. I mentioned this in a class once, and one of the students in my class got up and said, I've been in education for 20 years, it's the first time I've ever heard anybody say that there's anything good about failing. And in an innovation culture, failure is the road to success. So I've already spoken too long about one question. I would say is we need to bring together thinking from science, from practical experience and from families who are raising children and be provided opportunities to identify problems, try new ideas and learn from failure and not hide the failure from the funder. I that would be my kind of most provocative first statement about that. Good. Keep okay. going well, until we get it right. That's helpful. And I, I, at the same time, I, I encounter a lot of, of folks in the sector who say, well, you know, I, I get Jack's point about eliminating some of the stressors. That's what Tony talks about is the, you know, the amount of stress that floods the systems with cortisol in these neighborhoods where you can't get housing, you can't get jobs, racism is pervasive. I mean, if you just take those three problems, those are difficult for people in the education sector to control or influence or overcome. And, uh, and so it, uh, I think it's a, there's a challenge here in how you generate hope and a sense that uh, there's a sequential pattern that you could go through uh, to mitigate some of these factors. But let me just leave that as a comment and because we've got a number of questions coming in. So here's one. Um, can we quantify the extent to which the negative effects of extended time in poverty is mitigated by prenatal zero to three programming? I mean, is that a highly leveraged intervention in your experience? So I would say that the prenatal to, and actually I like to talk about a prenatal of birth to two rather than to three yeah. for two reasons. One is if you say birth to three, people rose their, roll their eyes and they say, okay, here we go again. Um, if you say birth to two, people say, whoa, why are you saying two? <laughs> so it's, uh, and I think we need to get people's attention. And the reason to say two is because actually a lot of stuff we're learning about critical and sensitive periods in both the brain and in other biological systems seems to be concentrated in the first 12 to 24 months after birth. It's not, again, I don't want anybody to misunderstand. It's not, there's never a time when you can't do anything 
anymore. It just gets harder. So I think when we look back at some point, we have to start paying more attention to these younger ages because we're playing catch up already at age three, especially for the most disadvantaged part of the population. Um, but that doesn't mean that we just automatically shift and say, okay, let's just fully fund all these prenatal programs and, and home visiting programs and early head start and stuff like that. They, all of them are in the same category. We need to make them better. They're a good start. They're a good infrastructure. But all of them, including pre-K programs, including K-12 programs, need to get better. But we need to start investing more in these earlier years because all the later years, obviously, this is the cliche, but it's true. Pre-K will do better if we do more prenatal to age three. And K-12 will do better if we do a better job in pre-K. That's real. That's real. That's not just a slogan. Jack, I've got a COVID-19 question. So in the midst of this crisis and from where you sit, do you find uh, community leaders and uh, uh, you know, sector change agents and so forth paying attention to early childhood? Uh, or is all the focus on K-12 and higher ed, that's where you hear most of the media these days, um, is it on other issues like healthcare and internet and hunger and things of that nature. What are you seeing as the handles and opportunities in this crisis from an early childhood perspective? So from, from the perspective of public awareness and public attention, I think early childhood, especially um, before pre-K is, is extraordinarily vulnerable and marginalized in this environment. Um, number one, because uh, the very, very rare exceptions Kids are not vulnerable to disease. So people say, okay, we don't have to worry about these really young kids. Same way they say we don't even have to worry about kids because they seem to be relatively resistant. Um, then the issue becomes one of, so um, these kids are at home, right? They're at home with families. They're not, um, and uh, it's easy for them to be invisible. And they have the biggest threat to very young children in this environment, the mental health consequences. Um, not so much of the isolation, but the mental health consequences for the adults who are caring for them. So this is kind of like a real time bomb of a hidden problem of the extraordinary levels of stress faced particularly by families with limited resources, isolated at home with young children. I, I can't, it's hard to even begin to imagine when you see how hard it is for two parent families who are struggling, um, who've lost their jobs, um, but have some reserves is what it must be like for a single parent with no money and young children. So I, I really fear that this part of the population is kind of lost in the shuffle. The other thing from a science, from a policy and a particularly a service delivery point of view, the childcare uh, system, which is really not a system, is taking a huge hit. Everybody worries about all the restaurants that won't come back. Um, there's a large percentage of childcare centers and particularly family child care and informal care that are not gonna come back <laughs> when things open up. They're, they just will not have been able to survive. And once again, so now everybody understands how critical child care is because people can't go back to work if they don't have child care. But um, we've, we've also, there's an opportunity here. I don't know how effective we'll be in, I think people understand this, that child care is not just about a place to park the kids so parents can work but that these environments, these experiences are having a big influence on whether we're building resilience and a strong foundation or whether we're reproducing a lot of vulnerability for kids in terms of school and in terms of education. So I think the early childhood population is really suffering from relatively low visibility, except when it comes to child care for people to go back to work. Yep. Okay, we're, we're running short on time. So I'm gonna bundle a couple of questions in the interest of- um, Also interrupt me, Paul, and let me give shorter answers. So you can all right, well, let me bundle a couple of questions because they're practice oriented and, and see if you could uh, respond to those. Uh, can you give an example of a, a, an early childhood program that addresses variation and sensitivity to context? And then a related question, how can we reconcile the importance of timing and critical periods, the achievement gap, and the developmentally accelerated school readiness expectations, such as sitting for long periods of time? Oh God, <laughs> how do I click on that? So give me that first question. Do I have an example of a program that's trying to- That addresses that? I, variation and sensitivity. I, I, don't, I don't know of any um, 
any uh, kind of system or program serving large numbers of kids that have been able to operationalize that yet. I know a lot of people are sensitive to it. They're focused on it. I have yet to see anyone who has been able to kind of institute an evaluation system that connects to that. It, it, this is where we need sophisticated methodological expertise linked to on the ground classroom experience. I haven't seen that happen yet. It's wide open, but I, I'm, I don't know a lot about that uh, area on the ground. So there may be examples that I just don't know about. And what about, what about, you know, how can, uh, how do we reconcile the sort of, you know, standard sort of uh, average schooling approach to the variations that we have uh, uh, in, in what students need at particular times that you've pointed out and, and reconcile that with something like how long we ask students to sit in school which might be yeah. right appropriate for one student, but not for another. So this is my chance to give one of my favorite answers. I always look for a question for this. Um, if any of you are ever um, asking questions of someone who's put up as an expert and that person never says, I don't know, don't trust any of the answers you get. So I don't really know the answer to that question, but I, but I, I think all of everybody in the audience knows more about that than I do as an expert. But the point that I would put on the table is that uh, I think what we're really dealing with here is not so much just, you know, what does the evidence tell us, but strong philosophical differences that people have about, and I don't mean just people in the education system, but parents, and the general public, about this is this unending battle between, you know, kind of highly structured curriculum versus kind of more child-centered kind of play-based learning, um, all of these things. I, to me, this is as much philosophical differences this is as much differences in parents' values about whether they want to accelerate their children's development um, or whether they want to let them be kids and learn at a, at a more varied pace. I don't think it's a science-based answer to that question. Yeah. All right, so we're out of time. I mean, part of the thing to the audience that I have to say we're doing is we've been, we've been sort of encouraged to think of shorter Zoom periods. So we have a relatively short period for questions, but I. I want to wrap it up, Jack, and give you maybe one minute to answer this one. This is a big one. It comes from a superintendent of schools who's very appreciative of your presentation and asks, in the current COVID-19 environment, both with the intermittent nature of schooling we find ourselves in now and likely will for at least the next year, and with students and families immersed in the stress of health, housing, job loss, food insecurity greater than normal, what concrete steps would you suggest for education leaders to prepare and support our youngest students over the summer and throughout next year? Maybe you could just focus on something like the relationship building aspect of it. Yeah, that. yeah. I, so the two things come to my mind is um, the first that you mentioned, Paul, is that um, the most important continuity issue here, um, even if the people change, is that children at all the ages we're talking about except for infants, Children know that bad things are going on right now. Um, they're varying, there's a varying degree to which they're being buffered from this, but one of the most important things children need to stay healthy and to be effective learners is to feel a sense of safety. And so kind of in what, whatever ideas, curricula, schemes that people have, I would pay a special attention to the need to make sure that we're, we're, we're providing a legitimate sense of safety to children, uh, particularly through times that are different from what they're expecting. It's kind of really tremendously important. Um, the other obvious thing that, again, you folks know more than I do, is this tremendous inequity in access to the internet and access to kind of alternative modalities for people to kind of um, stay connected. And um, the great fear, and, and you know this better than I do, is that we will have massively increased the gap in access to resources for however long it takes to get back to school. And that that's gonna dramatically increase the magnitude of the disparities that we were dealing with before this all started. And uh, the, the last thing I'd say about this is any kind of complicated, there are a lot of complicated problems that get solved. Um, you know, in 10 years, this country figured out how to put somebody on the moon and bring the person back. Uh, and in World War II, people who got the best minds in the country and they produced uh, uh, an, an atom bomb that was kind of, you know, obviously not one of the great gifts. 
to society. But there, there is a capacity to, con to, to really answer complex problems if we create an environment that basically sets the people who work in it up to succeed, which means provide the resources and the space to try things and take risks with lots of protection and fail and learn from failure and then move forward and then learn from the next level of failure and move forward. We do not have a culture of that in our education or healthcare delivery system. We have a culture of that in biomedical research. The people working on the vaccine and the people working on new treatments will fail over and over again until they get it, but there's no question that they will believe they can get to it. We've had effective treatments for AIDS and in 25 years, we don't have a vaccine for AIDS yet, but it doesn't mean that sometime that won't happen. There has to be an environment that says, we will figure this out and we will stick with it until we get there. And this is maybe one of the opportunities out of what you talked about, Paul, of the crisis is could we for the first time genuinely set up areas, have Bell Labs around the country in educational settings where we give really creative people as much time as they need to figure this out as opposed to ask them to change the world in a two-year demonstration project. I Jack, mean, this is- I wanna, We wanna thank you. Unfortunately, we're out of time and we wanna thank you for helping us figure this out uh, by opening our minds, by informing us of the science in a really accessible way and by challenging us to address some uh, design principles that we should bear in mind as we go forward in doing this work. So uh, I know the audience joins me in uh, uh, thanking you deeply for being with us and for all you've given us to think about and good luck to you and Godspeed in your work. Thank you, Paul, and the same to all of you. Really appreciate the time. Thanks for being here. Okay, well, I'm sorry that we didn't get to all the questions. Hopefully we'll have some time to revisit those in other contexts as we move through the conference. Uh, just a couple of quick notes before we sign off. Um, for those of you attending the By All Means Consortium, please join us for our next session, which is at 1.30 p.m. Uh, Eastern Daylight Time. How do we build a better America in the wake of the pandemic? That's the title of that session. Uh, and just a reminder to join sessions, you'll need to have registered